Hi everyone, well I'm glad to bring you another message today on our identity as the Bride of Christ. Uh, and last time I spoke on this topic I gave an overview to show you the spiritual truth that uh, in Christ we are his Bride. I spoke about God the Father's plan in selecting and preparing a spotless Bride for his worthy Son. Today I want to go a little deeper into this paradigm and talk to you about how God's will is to use our experiences through this life to prepare us for the day that we are presented to Jesus as his bride. Uh, the first thing to understand is that our salvation in Jesus is an invitation to experience the deep things of God's heart that he's prepared for us. Typically, when people talk about salvation, they major on the truth that in Jesus, your sins are forgiven and you're delivered from the wrath of God. And that's true, of course, and it's worthy of so much praise. But the Lord doesn't want you to stop there. That's the entry point into his kingdom. It's the point of reconciliation, where once you were an enemy of God under his judgment, and now you've become a son of God under his blessing but that certainly isn't the point to stop and to plateau on your spiritual walk with Jesus if someone bought you a mansion and they gave you the keys to a mansion which would be nice wouldn't it but if they if they did that they'd be disappointed if you then just rejoiced that you were officially the owner of this grand property but you never got inside of the place to enjoy all that it offers God's kingdom is a little bit like that our salvation is like that. Eternal life is like that. It's an invitation to come into communion with God and experience all that he has stored up for you in his kingdom. Salvation is so much more than a pass into heaven when we die. And God wants you to go beyond the basic truths of salvation, which are glorious in themselves, no doubt, but he wants you to enter into the fullness of the eternal life that he's given you. Let me share some scriptures with you that will help elucidate that idea. And let's begin in John 17 verse 3. And Jesus is praying here to his father in his longest prayer recorded in the Bible. And this is what he says to his father. He says, Father, this is eternal life, that they know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So eternal life, according to Jesus' definition, which really is the only definition that matters, is to know God and to know his Son. And that knowing that Jesus talks about is not simply an intellectual knowing. It's a relational knowledge. There are levels, aren't there, to knowing someone. I can say, in one sense, that I know King Charles in, in, in the sense that I know who he is and I know some things about him. I can say that I know my next door neighbour to a greater degree. I'm on first name terms with them. If I was walking out in the town and they seen me in a crowd, they would know me and they would spot me and they would probably say hi. I, I know them on that level. I can say that I know my wife Liz on an entirely deeper level. I know her with a depth that I don't really know anyone else. I'm on a level with her where I even know how she thinks. I know her likes and I know her dislikes. I know what makes her joyful. I know what grieves her. I know her heart and I know her desires on a level that's beyond words, really. And that's because we've invested in our relationship in getting to know one another over the last 12 years. Someone could ask me what Liz would think or feel about something and I'd pretty much be able to tell you with good accuracy without asking her. I'm connected to her on that level and the same is true the other way too. She's connected to me on that level. She knows me inside out. She pretty much knows what I would think about something without asking me. Uh, often I think she actually knows me better than I know myself and when we think about knowing God and we think about knowing his son, Jesus Christ, that's the kind of knowing that he invites us into. Um, when we talk about Jesus being the bridegroom and us being the bride, and we talk about that intimacy of knowing, don't 
think about that in a sensual way. I'm, I'm, please don't get mistaken. I'm not talking about it in a sensual sense. It's a unity of the heart, though. And it's a growing in knowing his heart towards you. It's a growing in knowing his plans for you. It's a growing in knowing his will for the earth and for his church and for yourself. It's an increase in understanding of his heart in relation to everything that goes on around us and in our lives. This is eternal life because he is good and to have spiritual union with him on the heart level is exactly what he's created you for. It's what completes you. It what, it's what restores you uh, into the image that he's created you in, that image that's been marred by sin. It's that which brings you back into alignment uh, with the very purpose for why you exist. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 9-10, the Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. I'm sure you'll know that a key part of your salvation is receiving the Spirit of God. The Bible says that those who have the Spirit of God are sons of God. You can't be saved without possessing God's Spirit. The Spirit cleanses us from sin and the Spirit empowers us to service for God's kingdom. It also reveals to us the things that God has planned for us. And that's exactly what this scripture is saying. It's what Paul is saying. The Spirit searches even the depths of God. The Spirit searches God's heart to know his feelings towards us to know his plans for us to know all that he's prepared for us and the spirit then imparts to us that very understanding and in that way he grows our love for god the spirit helps us make sense of what god is doing in the world uh, when to the people of the world the chaos they see and the chaos they experience in life is a reason to disbelieve God but the Spirit enables us to see God's loving hand in guiding us as his bride through the hardships of this life readying us for Jesus's return so what I want you to see here is that salvation is about a lot more than living forever it's a progressive journey into the knowledge of God the Father and into the heart of our bridegroom Jesus and to grow in the knowledge of God and to grow in the love of Christ is to grow in receiving their love together. As we grow in an understanding of who God is and what God is doing and why God is doing it, our heart towards him and his son is inflamed because we see his goodness throughout it all. At Romans chapter 5 verse 3 to 5 says that we can rejoice in our sufferings through this life because we have a hope that does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that in receiving revelation of our eternal hope, the Spirit kindles a love for God within our hearts. Let me put it another way. Uh, as we look forward to the marriage supper, with Jesus that I talked about last time and the glo glorious hope of being fully united to the one who died for us and to the father who planned it all we can then press through the sufferings and we can even rejoice through the sufferings because that vision of our hope that he's bought for us stirs up a love for him in our hearts it enables us to overcome as we grasp that Jesus is a bridegroom who died for us and he's a bridegroom who is leading us in love and as we see that the father is committed to readying us to produce good fruit and is using all circumstances in our lives to bring that forth as a fragrance for Jesus so we get ready to be equally yoked with Christ 
And it's then we can trust in his leadership as we see what he's doing through the midst of our lives. Then we can understand why he allows things in our lives that are often uncomfortable. Then we can understand why sometimes he brings difficulty and even difficult people into our lives. Then we can see beyond the pain and we can accept that his leadership in our lives is driven uh, by a deep, deep love for us. The love a bridegroom has for his bride. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus' words about the last days are recorded. He warns his disciples about the trouble that's going to come into the world. And then he gives a stark warning to us. Jesus says, because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. What is it that we need to understand from these words of Jesus? Well, it's very clear. God is going to permit darkness to increase as we go through time. The darkness in this world will get darker. Lawlessness will increase, says Jesus. Now, that includes lawlessness that breaks the laws of our land. Things like murder, rape, abuse, stealing, looting, fraud, all those kind of things. But it specifically refers to lawlessness related to God's standard of lawlessness. You know, there are behaviours that are permitted by our government which are lawless in the sight of God. Drunkenness, sexual immorality, greed, anger, gossiping, slander, the slaughter of innocence, envy, covetousness, idolatry. All of these things will increase as the darkness gets darker because that is the darkness. And you know, those things will be found outside of the church and they'll be found inside of the gathered church as well. And for many, Jesus says, that will cause their love to grow cold. He's talking about their love for God and their love for people. As lawlessness increases, the love of their hearts will grow cold. The love folks hold in their hearts for their creator and for people made in his image will be extinguished because they will be offended that God is allowing the lawlessness. God's permissive will, which is it's not his perfect will, it's not exactly what he would desire, but it's what he allows, will offend them to the point where they reject Christ. There will even be people who followed Christ who will reject Christ because they will be offended with what God is allowing. They'll, be, they'll begin to ask the question, which is frankly the most common question we get barked at us when we're out on the streets evangelising. If God exists, why is there so much suffering and pain and crime and immorality in this world and the issue here is that these ones who once loved God but whose love is growing cold did not give themselves to enter in to the knowledge of God they didn't give themselves to embrace the fullness of the eternal life that he offers they didn't go into the mansion as it were and enjoy what was inside they didn't enter fully into the kingdom what I mean by that is they've not grown over time in their spiritual understanding of how God is guiding the world and how it relates to them. They don't see God's hand at work preparing his bride to meet his bridegroom. Uh, they've not invested in truly getting to know him. So they don't have a grid for why all of these things are going on in the world. They don't see God's vision through it all. And so they become consumed with offence. Their whole concept of salvation was limited to God giving them circumstantial blessings in this life and helping them avoid hell in the age to come. It's remained shallow in that sense. It's got no deeper than that. It's not got past uh, what Hebrews calls the elementary stage. They've not given themselves to grow in spiritual understanding of the heart. Uh, they've not taken on the posture of Mary, who sat at the feet of Jesus and really invested in getting to know him, where Jesus says she's doing the right thing. She's chosen the better part and what she's chosen will not be taken away. What he meant was as she's cultivated that knowledge of God, that understanding of his heart, uh, that won't be snatched from her. That's going to be in her life. That's, that's going to work in her life. These ones in Matthew 24 that Jesus talks about, whose love has grown cold in their hearts, uh, they, I believe, are the virgins of Matthew 25, whose lamps are without oil, 
when the bridegroom returns. You know the story, ten virgins, uh, all with lamps, five who've got oil, five who haven't got oil. Jesus comes back and the five without the oil want to borrow from the five who have it. And Jesus says, no, by that point, it's too late. Uh, you can't borrow spiritual history, cultivation of intimacy with God from another person. Your spiritual history is something that isn't transferable. It's not something that you can impart. Yes, you can impart wisdom to people. Yes, you can impart uh, truth to people when you're with them, but you can't impart your spiritual history with the Lord that you've cultivated over the years. The, the, the five with oil are a representation of those who've cultivated the love of Jesus in their hearts through the Spirit in this life. It's a, it's a love that's grown as they've received the truths about his kingdom which have been revealed to them. It's a love that's grown from understanding about God's eternal plans and how they fit into it. It's a love that's grown as they've continued to go before God in prayer and to ask him for more than circumstantial blessings in this life, more than a new job or a new house or a new car. They've gone before God and they've said, God, give me spiritual insight and discernment about your will. Help me, as Paul prayed. Help me approve of what is excellent. Uh, help me abound in love for you, God. They, they've prayed prayers like that with a sincerity of heart. It's, it's a love that's been cultivated in them as they've been granted to see God's goodness in allowing them to go through pain and through suffering in their lives. They've taken time to understand what he's doing. So how do we avoid offence? How do we avoid becoming people whose hearts grow cold as lawlessness increases? Well, we give ourselves to understand who God is and what God is doing as revealed in his word. And we we keep inquiring of him in prayer. We keep coming before him and we, we, we inquire and we sit in silence and we listen to him and we keep petitioning him for understanding. We keep pouring over his word and asking for insight. And God will grant a knowledge of himself and of Christ if we're hungry for it. And if that hunger drives us to our knees and drives us to his word, where our heart cry is that we know nothing except the truth. Where we say, God, your ways are higher than my ways. I don't want to be led by my ways. I don't want your ways to be my ways. I want my way to be your way. I want to follow your way. And a key part of this truth that we need to see is that God is preparing his church as a spotless bride who loves Jesus to the degree Jesus loves her. And it's us becoming the answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17 that the love that the Father and the Son have would be in us. Not just a static love in us, not just a love that we feel and we enjoy, but a love that we respond back to God and Jesus with. One place you see this truth that I'm talking about unfolded is within the Song of Solomon, which is a prophetic pr picture of the journey of the bridegroom leading his bride and helping her get herself ready for the day of marriage. And you see that Jesus has to lead his bride through hardships and that by the end of that book, she learns to lean on him. She learns to rest in his love and to lean upon him and to be in him and to be one with him. Uh, in the Song of Solomon, we see various seasons of the bride's life. We see her First of all, being burnt out through having the wrong focus in ministry. There's this season of her life where she neglects her own relationship with the Lord because she's so driven in fulfilling the Great Commission. She ends up wearied and she has to retreat from her works. And, and then through the next season, he allows her uh, to be nourished by him and to learn to um, minister from a place of being one with him. We see a season of her life next where uh, the presence of the Lord gets taken away from her and she goes through a dry and barren season in her life. Uh, but we see that God does that in her life to grow her hunger for him, that she hungers and thirsts for his presence and for righteousness. And 
she's just gotten too comfortable in this place where she's at and the Lord wants to take her further. He's so committed to grow her in love that he removes his presence that she would hunger after him. We see another season of her life uh, where she's abused by elders in the church and they don't act in a way that godly men should act and she's wounded by them. And again, God allows that, awful as it is, in order to grow her dependence on Christ and on him alone. And finally, uh, we see her mature in love for Jesus, having learned to lean on him from that place of suffering and pain uh, and challenge in her life to bear fruit for him in her whole life and ministry. Now, those are all experiences that I know I can relate to in my life. Maybe you can too. Uh, I can certainly relate to burnout from neglecting my own intimacy with Jesus and just living to tend to the needs of other people. I can relate to seasons without knowing the tangible presence of the Lord. Uh, I, I certainly can relate to being wounded by people in the church and other trials and difficulties that I've gone through in my life, which may not fit into those categories, but certainly are difficult. Uh, the key thing with these things is how we respond to them. Uh, one thing I'm thankful for is that I've been able to walk through these seasons and keep following Jesus and keep loving the church and, and keep being committed to the church and not walking away from it. Uh, not because I'm a really steadfast guy uh, or I'm a guy who's full of faith. I've been able to do that because of the grace of God. And in his grace, he's revealed to me the truth that I'm part of a bride that Jesus is working to prepare and part of these hardships are my preparation for that marriage day. So now, like whenever I go through trials in my life, difficulty and pain, I do so with a vision that God is training me to rest in the love of Jesus. That Jesus is leading me through all these things. He's already gone through them and worse, but he's leading me as a bridegroom who's gone before me, as one who's already laid his life down for me, and he's, he's leading me through them, that I may know him and know what he suffered for me and know his love towards me and know his sustenance and, and know his nourishment. And as he does that, he prepares me to be equally yoked with him. He, he, he grows a love in my heart for him. And that's what he's up to. And that's his will for your life too as you go through trials and you go through pain and difficulty that you have that same understanding and you have that same vision because if you do it will sustain you and it'll help you overcome and the bible says in proverbs uh, 29 verse 18 that without prophetic vision the people perish uh, another translation says without prophetic vision the people cast off restraint and that's so true and i've seen that throughout lives where people have not had prophetic vision of the things I'm talking about. And when trials and difficulty comes, they cast off restraint. They just walk away. They walk away from the church. They walk away from their brothers and sisters. They walk away from the Lord. And to say they perish is true too, because if they walk away from the Lord, they're under the judgment of the Lord. We're only saved in Christ. If you don't have prophetic insight as to where God has taken you as part of Jesus' bride, you perish because your love for him grows cold. You cannot see what he's doing. You cannot see why he's doing it. The pain that you go through and the difficulty and uh, the irritations and the trial and the stress makes no sense because it seems to have no purpose in your life and you just end up quitting. That It happens so often. I see it so frequently and it grieves the heart of God. We have to become a people who can overcome all difficulties in this life because we see beneath the surface level of what's going on because we have that spiritual insight that prophetic insight uh, that doesn't mean that we are a prophet per se but it means that we have vision we have God's vision for what he's doing in the world because we've entered into the knowledge of God. We've entered into the knowledge of his heart. We've entered into the knowledge of his will. We've entered into the knowledge of who he's forming us to be in Jesus Christ. When people go through difficulties, a very popular scripture that always comes out, which you can probably guess what it is before I even say it, if you know the Bible, is Romans 
8.28 And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, of course, that's a blessed scripture for us. Uh, but do we know what it really means? Uh, when it says that for those who love God, all things work together for good, in what way do all things work together for good? Have you ever asked that question? Well, what is the good that he's working? What is it that he's seeking to work in my life? For some Christians, <coughs> for an awful lot of Christians, they take that to mean that if they go through hard circumstances in this life, those circumstances will somehow be used by God to bring them into a more prosperous place in this life, in the natural order of things in the future. So they go through difficulties and they're waiting for material blessings to come. Uh, they're waiting for, again, like career blessings to come or financial blessings to come or relational blessings to come in this life. Uh, they're looking for promotions to happen. Now, of course, if that then doesn't happen, they end up getting offended. God, why did you take me through this? You promised that you would bring good out of it. Where is the good in my life? I'm still in the same place materially. I'm still in the same job. I've still got the same car. I've still got people who dislike me. I've still got relational difficulties. But of course, that's not what it means. Again, it's a shallow understanding of the scripture. It's not a promise that if you go through hard times in this life, You'll then go through easier or good times or prosperous times later on in life. If that were true, then how does it apply to any of the apostles who ended up being martyred for the faith? How does it apply to the example of Jesus who, for three, minutes, three years of ministry, pretty much just went through difficulties until he got to the cross where they mocked him, they flogged him, they nailed him to a cross, and they lied about him, and then they watched him die, mocked him until he took his last breath. The good that God works in us is not necessarily a circumstantial good. It's an eternal good. It's a spiritual good. He works in all things through this life in order to grow our hearts for Christ, that we may be a prepared bride for Jesus. The, to be the bride is to be a people who grow in love. It's to be a people who return his love. It's to be a people who are equally yoked in love to him. That is the good that God is looking to work in your life. It's a good that is far above and beyond the natural experiences that you're going to have in this age. Uh, there's a scripture that I hold on to and I look to trust in when thinking about being part of Jesus' bride, and especially when I'm finding times difficult. And that is 1 Corinthians 3, 21 to 23. And I'm going to leave you uh, this week with this scripture to meditate on. This will be the last one I'll give you. And it says this. It says, For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. All things are yours, Paul says. He's talking to God's people. He's addressing the church. All things are ours. All things belong to us. He says whether it be the apostles, whether it be this world, whether it be this life, whether it be even death, or the present, or the future, all things are ours. Now, that might seem like a really odd thing to say. Like, in what way is everything that exists ours? Well, it's not in the sense that we own it, because God owns it. It's not in the sense that we control it, because God controls it. So it has to be in the sense that it's given for our good. All that happens in this world under God's sovereign hand, is working, is contributing towards our good. It is working to mature us in love for our bridegroom, Jesus. If we'll press in to trusting in his promises and cultivating intimacy with him through his word and through prayer, then everything will work for our cleansing. Everything will work for a maturity in love, a fullness in love. For, for some the things of this world, the things of this life, the things of the present and the things of the future 
will only cause them to be offended and their hearts will grow cold. But for those of us who keep trusting in God, he gives these things for us. He designs them for us. Even death, he says, he uses to mature us in love. Even the process of coming up to our deaths are used to mature us in love for Christ. He uses marriage. He uses childbirth. He uses parenting. He uses singleness. He uses the street where we live. He uses the people in the church in which he's placed us in and, and, and the people he's placed around us. He uses our bereavements, awful and painful as they are. He uses our suffering. He uses our victories. He uses our breakthroughs. All things are given that we may grow in love for him. And as I said last week, this is a truth that can only be received and understood by the Spirit. If it's something that you can readily accept, I want to encourage you to press in and ask God to help you walk in alignment with what I've shared today. Uh, walk in line with that vision that you are the bride of Christ and he's using all things to prepare you for the marriage supper of the Lamb, for that day with Jesus. Let that blessed hope of that day be your vision to help you press through. In the same way Jesus pressed through the cross for the joy that was set before him, let that marriage supper of the Lamb, when you're united to Jesus, where you see him face to face, where he He lets you sit on his throne and, and partake and judge in the world with him and the kingdom to come, let, let that vision get you through these difficulties. Let, let that vision help you through the good times as well, faithful in him. Now, if it's something that you're struggling to understand, if it's something that you find hard to receive into your heart, uh, ask the Lord to help you. Uh, someone said to me last week, they really found it difficult to receive the concept that as a man, they're part of the bride of Christ. And we encourage that person that it's not about gender, it's about uh, God's heart for us. It's about our position before him. But if you feel like that about that issue or any other issue that I'm talking about, go to God in prayer. And if you ask him, he'll give you the spirit and the spirit will give you understanding and the spirit will reveal to you God's intention in calling you his bride. And as you go to him in prayer, say to him something like this, use your own words, but something along the lines of this. Say, Father, Like, I, I can't fully receive this yet. I'm really, be honest, I'm, I'm, Father, I'm really struggling to receive this. But show me what it means that I'm part of your bride. Show me what it means that Jesus is my bridegroom. That Jesus is our bridegroom. Show me how you, Father, are directing all things in this universe. All the experiences of this life experiences which are joyful and painful. Show me how you're directing and governing all things for my good. Show me how you're using these things to grow my heart for Jesus and give me understanding and help me grow in love for Jesus and for you, Father. Pray something like that. And if you keep asking the Lord sincerely for that, if you keep praying like that, He promises he will give you his spirit. He promises he'll give you understanding. He promises that he will encounter you. He will draw near to you in that place of prayer. And that is the best gift that you can receive. Hallelujah. Uh, let us pray today and uh, ask God to apply these things into our lives where each of us are at right now. Would you pray with me? Father, we confess that this truth, that Jesus Christ is a bridegroom and we are his bride, is a lofty truth. It, it's a high spiritual truth, but it's a truth that cuts right into the reality of our lives. It's a truth that affects our hearts. It's a truth that is given to help guide us through this life in faithfulness towards you. I pray, Lord, if any of my brothers or sisters struggle to comprehend or to accept this truth, that, Lord, you would give them wisdom and understanding and revelation. I pray, Lord, that you would reveal scriptures to them which speak into this truth. 
I pray for prophetic insight, for understanding of the heart and understanding of the mind. I pray above all things that in this we would see your heart and the heart of Jesus for our good. Lord, the prayer of my life is that I would love you with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind and all of my strength. You say that that is the most important commandment. Lord, may this truth help us grow in love for you. Open our eyes to see your love for us. Open our eyes to show us your heart as you lead us through the seasons of our life. Pray especially for any brothers or sisters who are going through really painful times at the moment, either relational difficulties or health difficulties, um, financial difficulties, bereavements. Use the pain for your good, for our good for the good of your kingdom. Help us learn to lean upon you. Teach us humility, teach us meekness. Teach us to be at peace. Teach us to trust in your headship and in your leadership as we see your heart, your heart towards us. Thank you that in your word you call us your beloved that you see us in that way. Even in our weakness, you say that we are your beloved and you're committed to us. In the same way you were committed to Peter and when he messed up in his life and you stayed committed to him and you spoke prophetically over him about who you were calling him to be. May we receive an understanding of your heart and your feelings towards us, even in the seasons of our life where we feel weak even in the seasons of our life where we struggle to be as faithful as we'd like to be. Pray, Lord, that the grace of your heart would shine brightly in our lives. Beautify your church in love. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you this week. May you know uh, his love and his grace towards you in Jesus' name. Amen.